You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. People often ask me if I get nervous before one of these interviews, and the answer is yes, of course I do. Sometimes J.C. and I have to pinch ourselves as we drive up to the homes of these icons of country music, and when they open the door and they welcome us into their homes, we feel like we are recording stories that are part of music history. So you can imagine how incredible it was to be meeting songwriter and composer Steve Dorff. He's also the author of the book, I Wrote That One Too. Inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2018, the list of hits Steve has written for A-list artists, motion pictures, and television shows is so long, you just can't believe it. He loves what he does for a living. And I learned pretty quickly that Steve sees himself as a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. I'm like this anonymous Oz behind the curtain guy that uh, nobody ever knows. The face of the songs are the artists who record them. As we followed him down the stairs and into his incredible music room, which, by the way, is complete with a C6 grand piano, the walls were lined with plaques and awards and gold records. There was even a jukebox filled with his songs. I was curious about how old Steve was when his musical gifts became evident. Were the melodies always there for him? Did he hear them somehow in his head, even as a child? I pretty much heard a whole orchestra in my head. And whenever I heard music from the time my mother says I was in the crib, I would bang my head in in kind of tempo. And, she, you know, the, I think she thought, you know, I had epilepsy or something. But I saw colors. And, and, and just recently, maybe four or five years ago, I, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who explained it as uh, synesthesia. And which, which I had from birth, where I visualized music. Here your parents are seeing this child banging his head. When did they figure out that it was the music in you? I think when I was uh, three or four. My sister was 10 years older than me, and she took piano lessons. And so I would listen to her playing the same obnoxious song over and over and over for like four hours a day practicing, and I'd crawl up on the bench and play it better than she could. So that was kind of a telltale sign, I think. That feels yeah. like a prodigy to me. Um, I mean, yeah. I know you probably don't want to say that about yourself, but yeah. I hear a story like that, and I think prodigy. It was a gift, for sure, and sometimes a curse. The most conscious thing I remember is my friend uh, hitting a home run at a Little League game. And he was running around the bases, and everybody's cheering, and I'm orchestrating the whole thing in my head. And I asked my mother, I said, how did you hear that? And she said, what? I just assumed everybody had a little mini orchestra in their head. We so, have something in common, and uh, that is that I was born in New York City. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your family life. Where are you from in the city? Queens. Ah, yeah. Could you fall into a little New York accent for me if you wanted to? I can't. I, you tried I, to lose it for so long. Yeah, I've been gone for a long time. My went, parents were from the Bronx. I can fall into that if you want yeah, me to. Yeah, the Bronx is pretty, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty heavy duty. My, my parents were both from Brooklyn. Okay. So. Well, uh, we can talk like that too if yeah, you want to. Yeah, well, so tell me a little bit about your family life. Not great. My parents divorced when I was four. My mother and my grandmother and my sister were pretty much it. You know, yeah. But I'm guessing that the music was everything then. Totally. Mm -hmm. You came of age in the 1960s. Let's talk about that yeah. and what that did for I your was, music. Uh, I remember exactly where I was when I first heard I Want to Hold Your Hand. Uh, I was uh, in my mom's car. We were driving out to Valley Stream, Long Island. She had a red and white Ford Fairlane. I believe it was a 1957 I Want to Hold Your Hand came on the radio. I was, I think, 12. That was it. The Beatles were that seminal moment when I said, I want to do that. Now, before that, I remember on a black and white television seeing, uh, I think I was seven, when I saw Leonard Bernstein conducting the New York Phil, and I remember being just watching it and thinking, wow, those are the people that are in my head. And um, I'm doing that. Talk to me a little bit about your formal music education. Did you go to school for music? No. 
Okay, so I'm thrown out every music class I ever took. Why? Uh, I was always talking. <laughs> And seeing not, those and not, notes. And not paying attention. <laughs> I was given one piano lesson, but I remember telling the teacher that he wasn't playing it right. His timing was not good. I didn't know the phrase, you're not in the pocket, of course, as a kid, but he wasn't. He wasn't in the pocket. And, and that bothered me. That, that was driving me crazy. Yeah. So anyway, he, uh, he never wanted to give me another lesson. So, so are you basically self-taught? Did yes, you did totally. you teach yourself how to read music yes, as well? Yes, I did. Take us back to when you first got started as a musician. I started writing songs with my childhood friend. Uh, we were 13, 14. We formed a band. I had to teach all the guys in the band how to play their instruments because <laughs> nobody knew how to play anything. We were terrible. Tell so, me about your first hit song. My first number one was uh, Every Which Way But Loose, Eddie Rabbit. Eddie Rabbit. Yeah. I'd been writing and, and having songs recorded before that, but that was the first big hit. I think I read somewhere you had to pitch that song to Clint Eastwood. A very big artist, major artist, had written the title song to that movie, and Clint threw it out. He didn't like it at the at, at the eleventh hour is what I'm told, and so I got a call to write a song called "Every Which Way But Loose." Did and they I give s- you the title? Yes, okay. and they said, "All I know is it's a, a guy that's I haven't seen the film. It's a guy that rides around in an old beat up pickup truck with an orangutan who beats people up." I said, "Oh, great! That's a really cool song." Let me start thinking about yeah. that right now. So I called my friend Milton Brown, who lives in Mobile, Alabama. I was in Los Angeles, and. Uh, because Milton was Southern, and he, I thought he might know that phrase, and he did. And we wrote it over the phone. And the next morning, I went in and played it for Snuff Garrett, who was the music producer. He loved it. He called Clint. We went over to the studio. I played it for him a couple of times on the piano, and that was, that was it. The list of singers that have sung your songs is gigantic, from Willie to Whitney, from Gladys Knight to Clay Walker, Celine, Ray Charles, Reba to George Strait, Cher, Ringo Starr, Brenda Lee, Kenny Rogers. How does it feel to hear a gifted singer sing a song that you've written? No, it's everything. I'm like this anonymous Oz behind the curtain guy that uh, nobody ever knows. The face of the songs are the artists who record them. So, yeah, when a Barbara Streisand or a Kenny Rogers, Smokey Robinson, are you kidding me? This was my fantasy. When I was a kid, I, I don't know if you remember shows like Hullabaloo and oh, Of Shindig course I do. And, the uh, dancers up on yeah, those Yeah, I would watch those shows, the rock and roll shows, and see Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Righteous Brothers and Petula Clark and Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones and go, God, I want to write songs for these people. And I got to. I got to write for all of them. So they record the song, and then you get in the car one day, and you flip on the radio. I bet on a car ride, you could hear quite a few of your own songs on the radio, couldn't you? I, I, yeah, I have. I have. It still is great, you know. Or getting in an elevator or being in uh, a mall and you know, or in a dentist office, I remember. Being in my dentist's office, and a couple, you know, my a couple of my songs came on, and I was again, trying to talk. You know, so it's uh, interesting. You have also written the theme songs for so many legendary TV shows, including Spencer for Hire, you know, a Boston-based yeah. show, Murphy Brown, The Singing Bee, and As Long as We've Got Each Other from Growing Pains. Alan Thicke, I used to love that show. A very young Leonardo DiCaprio, right, in that Correct, show? Correct, yeah. Last season he was on. What's the story behind that song? I know you wrote it in a very short period of time. Great story. I, I was asked to go to Warner's to uh, meet the producers of a new TV pilot, a half-hour sitcom. I took the meeting, and uh, they said, well, why don't you uh, watch the pilot? We have a little viewing room. It's 22 minutes long, and then we'll talk about the music. And I said, great. When I met with the producers afterwards, there were three of them, and they all wanted something different. So I went home, and uh, 
I had a write that day with uh, John Bettis. We were going to finish uh, a song that we were really excited about. And I said, hey, before we do that, can you help me write this thing for, you know, this TV thing? And I gave him the 10, 15 words or less synopsis. And he just started scribbling down this lyric on a yellow pad, and he stuck it in front of me. And uh, we wrote that song in like uh, I don't know, five minutes. Did you guys have a certain chemistry? I mean, you were able to sit down with him and give him the 10 to 15 yeah, we word did. synopsis. Yeah, I think in collaboration, per se, uh, there are some that you click with more than others. Uh, I've been very blessed to have four or five principal go-to people over the years because we kind of have this symbiotic thing that makes it very easy to communicate musically, and uh, we write very well together. I've sat in a room with amazing writers where we just stare at each other for a couple hours and come up with nothing. It's definitely a chemistry thing. A couple songs I'd love to know the story behind. I Cross My Heart, George Strait's song. Mm -hmm. What makes a hit song is the marriage between the right song and the right voice, the right artist. When Eric Kaz and I wrote that song, we thought it was boys to men, and we demoed it that way. We did a demo. We had some singers come in, made this great R&B version of it. Boys to men hated it. I went back into the studio after pitching it for a while, went back in and did a uh, female version, and Bette Midler recorded it. We were very excited until we heard it. It was it was not a great record, and, and even though Bet is a phenomenal artist, it just wasn't a right match. And then for seven or eight years, I played that song for everybody I knew, and they all said, well, it's nice, but not one of your best. And then I got hired to do a movie called Pure Country that starred George Strait, and I was doing all the music for that. And the director called me one day before uh, shooting began, and he said, I don't have the ballad for the end of the movie. So I, I pulled this song out one more time. Eight and figured, years old? Eight years old, and um, he loved it. We flew to Nashville, I think, two days later to play it for George and his producer, and they didn't love it. <laughs> but the producer of the film was a very powerful guy, and, and he convinced George to give it a shot. And he did, and the minute he opened his mouth to sing it, you knew it was golden. Number nine on the most loved... Greatest country love song ever written. How, yeah, is that crazy? I don't think boys to men would uh, would agree with that. But, <laughs> uh. I just fall in love again. I know the Carpenters, Karen Carpenter. I used to always say to myself, this girl's got a voice like a glass of water. I mean, mm -hmm. just pure and beautiful. She was something else. Karen. But it wasn't Karen who could make that song a hit. You were just talking about how you got to find the right singer. It was Anne Murray. Yeah, well, du uh, actually, Dusty Springfield recorded it after Karen, and she didn't put it out as a single. And then Anne, who was a big Dusty Springfield fan, as was I, heard it, and they recorded it, and her was the version. Through the years, mm -hmm. Kenny Rogers, I'm going to tell you something. As a radio disc jockey... I have personally played that record like 10,987 <laughs> well, times. I thank bet you. I paid your mortgage in a, for, I, I for a month. I hope so. Yeah, thank you. Tell yeah. me the story behind that song. I remember it like it was yesterday. Marty Panzer um, came over for dinner. We had written a few songs together. And Marty always would write the lyric first. He had a brown vanilla envelope. I said, what's in the envelope? He says, I've got something for you. I said, great. And... He, he would pull it out, and he would read it before he'd show it to me. And he had this strange delivery where he would act the song out. If you were watching it, you'd go, this, this is weird, you know. Is it almost like reciting a poem or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, and he's very emotional. You know, I can't, I, can't, I can't remember when you weren't there, when I ever cared for anyone but you. I swear. We've been through everything there is. But as he was reading it, I was hearing the music. And um, I yelled in to my uh, wife at the time and, and said, how long till dinner's ready? And she said, you know, probably 15 minutes. And so I grabbed Marty and we went back to the piano and wrote the song. How does it feel, Steve, when you have a song like that, that becomes part of pop culture in terms of that was my wedding song? 
that's the song that was playing when I met my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Right. You know, these songs become part of people's lives Absolutely. when you write a big iconic hit like that. I have some great stories about people that have written me and one person uh, was an architect and he put the lyric on the side of a building he was building. And uh, another woman uh, whose mother loved that song, uh, they put the lyric on her tombstone. You know, two major artists passed on that song. Who passed uh, on uh, that song? Barry Manilow and Glenn Campbell. The award that most means something to me because it's a career award is is being inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame because that's hard to do. And, and, and that is an incredible... You said when you got that honor, and it, by the way, your son's speech was amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. He really loves you. Yeah. <laughs> the tears were there. You said that was the greatest honor of your life. It was. Take me back to that night. How did you feel? I mean... Oh, it was just, uh, you the know... pinnacle? pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for, for a songwriter. Um, it just doesn't get any better. I mean, there are only, there's only been, I think, 430 people inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, uh, you know, starting with Irving Berlin. I mean, you know, to Elton John, to Lennon and McCartney, to Bacharach and David. I mean, it, it's just, you know, it's rare air. You know, rare air, I Rarif like that. rarefied air. Yeah. yeah. One of the roles that you have to play as a producer is to tell singers how to sing sometimes. Yes. What's <laughs> that? <laughs> he laughs. Well, tell me what that's like to say, hey, Celine, can you do it this way? Well, because, <laughs> yeah, because they, you know, they they are great vocalists. Their genius is in their vocal cords mine is not you know when i sing it's uh, it's it's oh, not I pretty pretty good actually so, but i know how i hear, hear it. it you know i know how i should hear their voice doing it and so i try to get that out of the artist that i'm working with and i'm gonna guess that in terms of your communication with an artist and it's so personal for them you know when they're laying their heart out and they're they're performing <laughs> right <laughs> right there's a way to do it and a way not to. And I'm going to guess you have to read their body language, read their mood. Know when to say something and when not to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. especially women. Cause <laughs> and I've you've worked with so I've many. I've worked with a lot, a lot of divas. But somehow it's, you know, I haven't pissed too many of them off, uh, I don't think. Dusty I did once. but Really? Yeah, she threw a chair at me. You're still here to tell it. Uh, yeah, You're still here to well, tell the Well, she threw a chair at the glass. Oh, uh, you know, okay. I, I was behind the glass in the control room. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't really at me. It was more of her frustration, frustration at herself. I got you. Uh, I got you. Yeah. Your book is called I Wrote That One Too, and I love that oh, thank title. You. Thanks. You've said, I have loved the life of being a songwriter. What is at the core of that joy for you? God, I'm so lucky to get to do what I'm so passionate about. I don't have another job. Uh, never have. You never had to have another job, right? No. No. You flip on the radio and you say to yourself, I wish I wrote that song. What's that song for you? Oh, oh boy. There's a lot of them. Tell me. Uh, Alone Again Naturally comes to mind. Oh, there's so many. So many. I mean, the obvious ones are all the Beatles songs, all the Backrack and David songs, all the Jimmy Webb songs that oh, I love. Jimmy uh, Webb is one of my yeah, favorites. Yeah, The Moon's a Harsh the Mistress. Are... Yeah, I recorded uh, that song. You did? Oh, yeah. yeah. There have to have been hard times. Oh. It's not yeah. all easy, is it? Still are. How do you stay strong when someone says, eh, I don't like that song. Nope, I don't want that. How do you stay strong? There's rejection here, huh? Oh, it's uh, this business is total rejection. A any any artistic, uh, you know, whether you're a screenwriter, an actor, an actress, a songwriter, if you're not prepared to pick yourself up and dust yourself off a couple of hundred times a week, you should probably uh, <laughs> bake bread. Was there somebody who gave you a chance early on? Well, Clint Eastwood comes to mind. He really did give me the biggest first break of my career but there have been a lot when we first arrived and we walked down these stairs here in your home into this beautiful music room with your piano here this gorgeous is that a c7 
No, it's just it's a C six. Oh, it's yeah. absolutely beautiful piano. The walls are lined with gold records. The lists of artists that you've worked with falls off the table. What are you most proud of? Hmm. God, you ask really good questions. You know, you haven't asked me what comes first, the words or the music. Well, that's, um, <laughs> that's actually going to be my next question. What I'm, I think, Although I think what, you already I answered I think what that. I'm most proud of is the diversity, the, the fact that I was never bagged as a country writer or a pop writer or an R&B writer or a theater writer. Uh, you know, um, the diversity of the artists that have recorded my music kind of speaks for itself really does uh, from Andy Williams to you know to Whitney Houston to uh, Barbara Streisand to Kenny Rogers to George Strait like you had mentioned I mean it's just uh, Tom Jones Ray Charles I mean Sammy Davis Jr. recorded one of my songs it's pretty it's pretty cool were you in the room for Whitney Houston's? Did I was she not did, she did a duet on your With song Jermaine is that Jermaine Jackson, Jackson? Yeah. I played that yeah I uh I played that song for Jermaine. He had asked me for a duet. Good story about that song. It was his first album for Clive Davis at Arista Records. And he loved the song and uh, said, I'm cutting it today. And I, I thought, oh, great, Aretha or Dion Warwick, who were the two big women singers on Arista Records at the time. I said, is it Aretha? Please tell me it's Aretha. And he said, no, no. He says, it's a new artist. And my heart just sank. And all the way on uh, going home, I thought I'd slit my wrists and, you know, because I wanted Aretha so bad or Dion. And uh, turned out to be this young girl from New Jersey, Whitney Houston. And, uh, you know, 27 million albums later. You never know. I was once told that she had a voice like a Stradivarius. <laughs> Somebody told me that. Hmm. And pretty close to it. Yeah. I think Celine does too. I yes. I, I think Celine's voice is a, is an instrument. It's like a it's like an oboe. It's you know? rare it's, air. Yeah, it really is. It's uh yeah. But Wh Whitney, I mean, what can I say? She was just amazing. What is star power? It's undefinable. It really is. It's um yeah, you you there's so many talented people that are not stars. There's just this intangible thing. The it factor. That makes someone a Barbara Streisand or, or a Willie Nelson. Or, a, you know, they're all brilliant. I mean, brilliant voices. But there's something that's just, you can't really define it. Final question. Fill in the blank. The key to success in country music is I think the key to success in music period is never taking no for an answer I want to say thank you so much Steve for telling us your story and for sharing it with country music thank success you. thanks stories. for having me this has been fun thank you very much mm -hmm. now that is a true songwriting superstar hi this is JC Don Valeris your music city mentor Steve Dorff's body of work speaks for itself, and as someone who is ever curious about the mindset of a person just getting started in the music industry, I had to ask Steve this one question. Steve, of all the adventures that this business has taken you on, what do you most wish you knew when you were just starting out? God, that's a good question. <laughs> how, how difficult it was going to be. And maybe that was a blessing, because that's what kept me undeterred and moving forward. What a great answer. And it's true, isn't it? Sometimes the not knowing is even better. I've spent a good portion of my life surrounded by artists, many of which have achieved great success. One thing I find in talking with all of them is they all say the fun is in the journey. It's in the getting there. Since none of us have a way of seeing into the future, the best way to set yourself up for success is to take a look at every single thing you're doing right now and make sure that the foundation you are about to build the rest of your career on is strong and steady. Today I wanted to talk with you about a few things that you should be doing every single day to keep this journey you are on headed in the right direction. Number one, post on social media. You should be doing it at a minimum once a day. 
I don't care whether you are an Instagrammer or a TikToker or an old school Facebooker. If you are not showing up for your audience on social media, you are missing a huge opportunity to grow your fan base and to keep the one that you already have engaged. I know it can be overwhelming to think about posting on socials every single day, but it doesn't have to be some thought-out professional photo of yourself in full hair and makeup or in a suit and tie. It can simply be you jumping onto your stories and giving a quick update on your day. That literally takes 10 seconds, and it's well worth it, believe me. Here's a quick tip. If you are super blocked on what to post, share your Spotify link or any other link to stream your music. That always works. Number two, read and reply to emails. I am a self-proclaimed email addict. I'm on my email more than anyone should be. But bearing some sort of weird occurrence, I answer every email that hits my inbox. And here's why. You never know when a connection is going to be one that could further your career. Make sure you always reply to fans, press inquiries, and any opportunity that pops up in your email, and do it in a timely fashion. It's so easy, and you don't even have to leave your couch to do it. Number three, practice your skill. Here is one that I'm amazed people don't take more seriously. If you are a singer, songwriter, or musician, you should be practicing on getting better at your talent every single day. Now, I'm not telling you to go sing all the scales in the middle of your living room at 10 p.m., but I am saying you should be doing a few things to keep those vocals staying strong and healthy every day. If you are a writer, make sure you're exercising that skill right every day. If you're a musician, pick up your instrument and practice your scales, soloing, learning a standard, anything you can do to keep those muscles strong and fluid. Don't get lazy with the one thing that matters the most to you achieving your success. Number four, check yourself for bad habits. If you've been at this a while, it's easy to become jaded and to let a little negativity sneak in. Try your best not to let this happen. Do everything in your power to shut down those negative thoughts when they sneak in and try to bring you down. Like Steve said in the interview you just heard, he never thought of himself doing anything else but music. There is something to be said for that. Keep your eye on the prize and don't let a negative mindset get in the way of your success. Finally, my last tip here is you should be networking every single day. Okay, so this hasn't been the easiest thing to do lately, especially over the last year. But there are ways to network even when you don't have the opportunity to be in a room full of people. Like I mentioned, sending emails is a great way to connect. Shoot someone an email that you haven't had a chance to see face-to-face -face in a while. Or book a coffee date via Zoom. Even connecting with someone on social media is a way of networking. If you are in the consciousness of others, you are getting the job done. With all of that being said, remember to enjoy every single step of this journey you are on because you are so lucky to have this opportunity more wisdom you can use from Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris, inspired by one of the greatest songwriters of all time, Steve Dorff. For a free songwriting tip sheet from J.C., just go to candioterry.com backslash country music podcast. Subscribe to J.C.'s YouTube channel for insights and advice on how to make it in Nashville. And if you liked country music success stories, please subscribe and also leave us a review. Check out our new website, countrymusicsuccessstories.com. Follow us on social at Candy O'Terry and at JC Don Valeris. And our Facebook and IG handles are at Country Music Success Stories. Thank you to Steve Dorff for welcoming us into his home. We've got more legends to meet and stories to tell. Until next time, this is Candy O'Terry, your host, saying thank you for listening to country music success stories.